the late philosopher Derek Parfit came up with a moral scenario where he envisioned a stranger sitting in front of you and you standing in front of the stranger with a dial. And every time you turn the dial, the stranger would experience a very tiny shock. Such a tiny shock that they wouldn't even notice it. So in this scenario, you turn the dial, the stranger receives the tiny shock, doesn't notice it, and then you leave. You probably don't think much of it. You certainly wouldn't lose any sleep at night. But as the scenario continues, what happens is somebody else comes and turns the dial. And then somebody else, and then somebody else. And then by the time hundreds or thousands of people have turned the dial, that victim sitting in the chair is now screaming in agony. Besides being this sort of twisted and demented thought experiment that philosophers often come up with, this example illustrates a couple of things. One of the things it illustrates is that sometimes actions that seem small and you might not even realize you're doing something wrong, when you combine those actions together with things that you have done or maybe other people have done, small actions can pile up and cause real damage that you're not even aware of. So Parfit might say, I think the average person probably doesn't feel bad about turning that dial because they can't see any observable effect on the victim. It doesn't look like The shock increased. The victim doesn't feel anything different. But in the aggregate, if you combine it all together, it ends up horribly. Psychologists Paul Bloom and Matthew Jordan wrote an article about this recently where they said that this type of philosophical experiment doesn't seem like it's very practical. But according to them, this philosophical experiment which is known as the harmless torturers, has suddenly become very practical in today's world. Here's what they say, quote, Today, in 2018, the two authors of this article are harmless torturers, and you, regardless of which side of any particular issue you are on, probably are one too. Parfit's scenario unfolds all the time on social media. Someone writes something ugly about you on Facebook, Depending on your relationship with that person, it may or may not be personally hurtful. But nobody notices it, and so it's not a big deal. But if a day later it has a thousand likes and several hundred mocking comments, you might well be crushed. Even though any particular comment on its own may have caused you little or no pain, the aggregate effect is far more severe. End quote. Bloom and Jordan go on to compare this idea of the harmless torturers and they connect it to mob mentality. So the actions of people in large groups who might not feel like they're contributing to what someone else in the group is doing, but maybe just by their presence there or some of the smaller scale things that they've done have given confidence to this idea of a swarm of angry people who are kind of swarming and potentially ignorantly attacking anything they see as weak. And of course, anyone who pays any attention to the internet or Twitter or social media in general understands this, regardless of the positions you take on issues, the more times you get likes, the more times you get retweets, the more times you get credits or whatever it is, the more bolstered you feel and the more just and correct you feel. Or at least that's the way it appears for people who actually get likes and retweets. I don't get many of those. But this article got me thinking about how the Cultural Revolution in China was a little bit like the social media of the day. In a way, your participation in the mob mentality and your participation in the revolution and your participation in the songs and the slogans and the everyday life of the Cultural Revolution was kind of like a social credit. 
it gave you validation and likes and respect from society around you. And the thing is that during the Cultural Revolution, because these people and these mobs basically were getting that validation and getting that social credit, they became utterly convinced that they were doing the right thing. Even if they weren't convinced that they were doing the right things, they might have seen it as, well, I'm just one of millions of people participating in this cultural revolution. So whatever justification they came up with for the small acts of the cultural revolution, the small acts of shaming, the small acts of vandalism, the small acts of violence, as Derek Parfit's harmless torturers scenario shows us, the collective action of the cultural revolution would become horrifying. last episode, we introduced the book Red Scarf Girl. It's a memoir about a girl by the name of G. Lee that survived the Cultural Revolution. We discussed how trying to eliminate the four olds was a key tenet of the Cultural Revolution, and Mao mobilized these kids, whether it be high school, elementary school, middle school, He tried to mobilize the whole youth of the country to go out and basically be his propaganda robots. So kids wrote what was called Dazabao, where they would write these big posters and insult and demean and humiliate anything related to these old ideas, old customs, old traditions, anything that wasn't praising Chairman Mao and the communist philosophy. We talked about how the education system basically just became a tool for Mao to mobilize and weaponize these young kids and use them to his own advantage. Personally, for Ji Li, it became very complicated very quickly because she was beginning to realize that she was going to have to choose between the party and her family. And she was very confused why she was being treated as someone who wasn't part of the revolution, even though she wanted to be and she was putting all her effort into it. Of course, the reason that she was being targeted was because her family had a poor background. From a political standpoint, her grandfather was a landowner. He owned property and employed people, which made him a quote-unquote landlord and someone that was public enemy number one, basically. There's a key moment in the story where G. Lee goes and tells her dad what's been going on and how she's kind of been targeted at school. And her dad tries to explain to her that the fact that your grandfather owned land and property has nothing to do with you. That's not your fault. You weren't even alive when he was alive. The dad says, look, I mean, you guys never even met. So why are you judging yourself based on what someone you never met did? You should be judged on your actions and your character and what you do as a person. So of course, being a kid, G. Lee goes back and tries to articulate this mode of thinking to her friends who are taking part in the Cultural Revolution. Here's G. Lee quoting a friend of hers who's now turned against her when she tried to explain, hey, I didn't even know my grandpa, why are you guys criticizing me for what he may or may not have done? Here's what the friend says, quote, Hey, listen everybody, Jang Ji Lee just said that she had nothing to do with her landlord grandfather, and she doesn't need to remold herself. She's denying the existence of class struggle, end quote. And of course, this is exactly the type of mob group type thinking that we talked about in the intro to the episode. It's full of logical fallacies. It's some combination of straw man, black and white, genetic fallacy. Pick your poison there, but you see what's happening. Because of her grandpa's landlord status, it doesn't matter what G. Lee does with the rest of her life because she will never be able to overcome that. 
She could be the most committed member of the Red Guard, but the cultural revolutionaries would always use that against her. One of the big themes of the book is G. Lee slowly realizing this. So over the course of the book, she slowly realizes that it's not going to be her actions that define her, but whatever is convenient and easy for the Red Guards or the Red Successors, that's what they called the younger version of the Red Guards, the elementary, middle school kids, whatever was easy and convenient for those people to pigeonhole her as. To the committed groupthink of the Cultural Revolution, one flaw and it's over. One mistake and you're done. As opposed to a complicated look at human nature where people are nuanced and can hold different positions on different topics. None of that was acceptable during the Cultural Revolution. And here's G. Lee talking about how it feels to be essentially betrayed by her own friends who have chosen the path of the Red Guards as opposed to the path of friends and family. Quote, I went numb. I stared at her, unable to hear another word. Was this the person I knew? I had helped Yin Lan Lan with her math three times a week for years, explaining each problem to her over and over until she got it right and Yang Fan. My friends and I had carried her on our backs to and from school for three months when she had broken her leg two years ago. And all of them. What had I ever done to them? Why were they suddenly treating me like an enemy? End quote. For Ji Li, the pettiness and meanness of her classmates during this time period was beginning to cause psychological distress. You can imagine that for the kids who were in the Red Guard, it might have felt like a catharsis or some sort of feel-good emotional release, but in the aggregate, all of this pettiness and meanness was going to create incredible long-term damage to the people of this generation in China. Some people refer to them as the lost generation in a very similar way that we talk about the lost generation of World War I, with all the crazy psychological things that that group of people had to go through. What Ji Li's family went through during the Cultural Revolution was actually typical of millions of people who had to deal with Red Guards marching through the streets, searching houses, vandalizing property, confiscating people and property. And G. Lee's family had to prepare by doing all the things that you think you would want to do to stay in line with the Communist Party. So they fired their housekeeper. They repainted a lot of the walls to fit more with the color scheme of the Communist Party. They repurposed expensive clothes and items into other items that could be used more practically. They burned old photos old items of clothing, old family heirlooms, and all of those memories, all of those traditions literally went up in smoke. But even with all the preparation and all of the hope that they could avoid some of the worst of the Cultural Revolution, you have to remember that they were dealing with something that had gotten completely out of control. The fervor and the energy that Mao had instilled in these Red Guards and in younger people mostly, but also just run-of-the-mill members of the party, was incredible. Listen to G. Lee tell the story that her friend tells her about getting the chance to see Chairman Mao in person. Quote, One day we heard that Chairman Mao was going to receive all the Red Guards at Tiananmen Square. We all went to the square right away, because we didn't know when he would come. We waited all afternoon. When night came, we stayed. There were thousands of comrades in the square, and we all spent the night establishing revolutionary ties. Right next to me, there was a comrade whose cousin had seen Chairman Mao. It was hard to believe that I would see him too. No one slept a wink. The next morning, many more came. The whole square was terribly crowded. 
There were tens of thousands of us sitting there, most of us dressed in army uniforms and all wearing red armbands. The sky was blue and the day was very clear. Everywhere you looked were revolutionary comrades. It was a truly magnificent sight. We waited and waited, straining our necks to be the first to see him. The sun was so hot. A few female comrades felt faint, but no one wanted to leave. Some comrades brought us water, but we never even thought of eating anything. Finally, at five o'clock in the afternoon, the people near the gate started cheering. I looked up, and there he was. He was right in front of me, up on top of the gate, waving to us. I was crying so much that I could hardly see anything else, but I could see him shining in his army uniform. And then, out of all the comrades in the square, he looked at me. He looked straight at me. I felt tears welling out of my eyes. I'm very lucky to have had such an experience. I have resolved to dedicate my whole life to Chairman Mao and the great proletarian cultural revolution. I will give every drop of blood in my body to work to liberate all of mankind. End quote. Okay, that's a long quote, but I wouldn't use that unless it was actually true. There were kids who got assigned to work in the rice fields during the cultural revolution as a show of strength for Mao Zedong that literally gave everything, but many never wavered in their dedication to Mao. That is the strength of the cultural revolution, and that's the strength of the cult of personality that Mao was able to create during the cultural revolution. That story, that quote from that girl, that was a little girl who traveled 15 days by foot with limited supplies to get to Tiananmen Square just to look at Mao. That's crazy. It almost baffles the mind trying to come up with something to compare this to, some sort of metaphor to make this more understandable, this crazy level of devotion that these young kids in China had to Mao. In my episode outline here, I had kind of a joke about comparing this to Bieber fever, and as I'm sitting here You just feel wrong doing that because you have to remember the victims that were just decimated by this crazy level of devotion. G. Lee tells the story of her friend's grandma who, essentially because she married a landlord, was shamed by the Red Guards and the Communist Party, and she was shamed to such a level that she committed suicide. G. Lee was there on the scene and had to watch as, well, here's what she says, quote, Is that white stuff her brain? A boy's shrill voice called as I turned numbly away. I could not bear to hear any more. G. Lee does something throughout the book that I think shows her kindness and her generosity. Throughout the book, when stuff like this happens, to the victims of the Cultural Revolution, she will go through some of the highlights and talk about some of the memories that she has with that particular person and some of the positives and how that person positively impacted her life and her memories and how it ultimately all these people helped her become the person she is today. So in the face of this incredible evil that's going on, G. Lee is able to take a moment and respect what these people have done for her, even if no one else is. In that particular case, her friend's grandma, she remembers all the times where the grandma had helped her friend with her asthma, and one time where she physically carried her friend to the hospital because of an asthma attack. And G. Lee has to do this on her own because in many cases there was not any sort of memorial or funeral or viewing. If you were lucky, you got kind of a rushed viewing without much of a advertisement or fanfare or anything like that, especially if it was a suicide. Mao Zedong considered it, quote, alienating oneself from the people, end quote. You really do respect G. Lee a lot more for taking the time to memorialize some of the victims 
as she sees it in her book. As we've pointed out before, sure enough, Geely herself and Geely's family would become the targets of the Cultural Revolution as things got more sinister. Their house was ransacked, their property confiscated, pretty much everything they owned. Geely now had to sleep on the floor. Her prized stamp collection was taken from her. One of the few things that she owned, one of the few things that she really devoted her time and energy towards. And as this is happening, of course, she's questioning herself and her role in the situation, which is what her dad didn't want her to do. He didn't want her to blame herself because it wasn't her fault. Here's what she says, quote, Home, I thought. Wasn't a home a private place, a place where the family could feel secure? How could strangers come and search through our secrets? If Grandpa was a landlord, they could confiscate all his things. But I was not a landlord. Why did they have to search through all my things? Why should I ask why? There was absolutely nothing I could do to change it. End quote. G. Lee's father would get arrested shortly after the search and seizure, and this would become probably the low point in G. Lee's life. She said bye to her dad, not knowing if she would ever see him again. Her dad was sent to a labor camp for being a supposed rightist and supposedly someone who was a landlord sympathizer. And G. Lee is straight up told this by the party. Here's one of the party officials talking about what happened to her father, telling this right to G. Lee's face. Quote, you saw your father. He is being remolded through labor. We have evidence that he has committed a serious counter-revolutionary crime, but he is very stubborn and refuses to confess. And your mother, she's another despicable thing. But you are different from your parents. You were born and raised in New China. You were a child of Chairman Mao. You can choose your own destiny. You can make a clean break with your parents and follow Chairman Mao and have a bright future. Or you can follow your parents and then you will not come to a good end. End quote. Of course, G. Lee is confused. Everything she's been taught her whole life has been to support Mao and the Communist Party. But here she is, on the other hand, with her dad in a labor camp and her mom sick and struggling. And she has to be just horribly psychologically tormented by this decision that she has to make between party and family. But during this low period in her life, there were sparks of humanity in the midst of all the chaos. From time to time, she'll have a one-on-one individual conversation with some of these horrible Red Guards, and when you get them one-on-one, they seem much more like the innocent kids she used to know, as opposed to the dangerous cultural revolutionaries. There was one moment in the book that stood out where she's at some sort of important assembly and, of course, all these Red Guard kids, all these Red Successor kids have their little red books. So Mao had every kid carry around this little red book of his sayings and some of the communist teachings and some of that type of thing. And, of course, on this particular day, Ji Lee forgot her little red book. As it became time to hold up her red book As everyone else was doing it, she realized it was gone, and she began to panic, because if it was found out that she didn't carry the book with her, of course bad things could happen to her, but more importantly, it could lead to bad things for her father in the labor camp or any other member of her family. And a stranger standing next to her, without even talking to G. Lee, realizes what's going on, rips off the front cover of her little red book, and gives it to G. Lee so that they can both hold up something that looks red. Despite these small acts of kindness, the Communist Party and the Red Guards and the whole machine of the Cultural Revolution was not going to let G. Lee get off without paying a price. So the same school officials and party member leader that talked to her before and some other members bring her in and they actually ask her to testify publicly 
against her dad in one of these humiliation gatherings. So people would get brought in in front of a big crowd and they would have stuff thrown at them and they would have to read from these horrifying scripts about how horrible they were and basically just a public humiliation. These party members also ask for any information about the family and they ask her to do this or else. There's definitely a threat to harm her family. Here's how G. Lee remembers that conversation with the same guy who had spoken to her earlier. This guy is trying to get her to testify against her dad. Quote, Now you have to choose between two roads. You can break with your family and follow Chairman Mao, or you can follow your father and become an enemy of the people. In that case, we would have many more study sessions with your brother and sister too and the Red Guard Committee and the school leaders. Think about it. We will come back to talk to you again. End quote. Notice there that he's intimidating, threatening, scaring, demeaning, and using the language of bullies to get what he wants. Amazingly, G. Lee doesn't view these specific party members and bullies as perpetrators. She views them as victims, people who were brainwashed and misled, captured by the worst parts of their inner nature. Here's what she says about the perpetrators. Quote, Except for a few who actually killed people, hardly any revolutionaries have been punished for what they did during the Cultural Revolution. Those who persecuted others, even beat or tortured them, were victims too, after all. They all believed they were doing it for Chairman Mao. In fact, many were caught on the wrong side in the power struggles and were persecuted in their turn. End quote. That takes courage and compassion to believe after all the ways that her and her family were hurt. So if these perpetrators or victims, whatever you want to call them, wanted G. Lee to make that final decision between party and family, that decision that we've kind of been building up to, at the end of the day, the decision was easy for G. Lee. Because in the end, after all the pain and all the suffering, with G. Lee basically taking care of her whole family, with her dad in prison, her grandma, forced to work, and her mom sick. When her mom asked her to protect her brother when she was gone, and G. Lee agreed, and after all that pain and suffering that G. Lee went through herself, she realized that she already made the choice, because there was no choice. She made the choice with all of her actions over time. In kind of the inverse of that harmless torturer scenario, Each small decision that G. Lee made over time, each decision to help out a friend, each decision to protect her brother, each decision to go to the grocery store and get food for her family, each decision to remember the victims of the Cultural Revolution. So what would it be? Her family or the Communist Party? She already made the choice with the accumulation of her actions over time. Here's what she has to say about that. Quote, I realized that I had made my promise to them, to everyone in my family long ago. I had promised during the days that Grandma and I had hidden in the park. I had promised when I had not testified against Dad. I had promised when I had hidden the letter. I would never do anything to hurt my family, and I would do everything I could to take care of them. My family was too precious to forget and too rare to replace. Once my life had been defined by my goals, now my life was defined by my responsibilities. I had promised to take care of my family, and I would renew that promise every day. I could not give up or withdraw, no matter how hard life became. I would hide my tears and my fear for mom and grandma's sake. It was my turn to take care of them. 